So, Paul, what is the law of spies? Shit, I don't know. Oh, Redmond's Redmond's law. Yes, please. Redmond's law is, quote, it's an actuarial certainty there will be a spy in your organization, period. Why is that something that you're so certain about? Because there always is. Nobody ever gets it right, but it's very simple. It's an actuarial certainty there's going to be a spy in your place. Paul Redman spent three decades at the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, recruiting assets and stealing secrets from the Soviets. I'm an Ivy League educated New England prep school snob who's not a nice guy. Plus, I'm Irish and I don't trust anybody. He's in his 80s now, retired, lives in a quaint suburb outside Boston. Catching spies is never easy. Human espionage is not nice. It's for nice Americans, But that was Redmond's job. Counterintelligence business requires you to be untrusting, conspiratorial, secretive, devious, double thinking, and very smart. The years of the spy in the mid-80s unearthed many high-profile traitors, but the arrest did not stop all the leaks or account for all the information lost. So the search continued. We're going to follow three investigations as the CIA and FBI tried to figure out who was the mole. In 1991, Redmond was part of a team made up of agency and bureau personnel. We started looking at about a dozen people closely. What we did, and I'm very proud of this, is we let the information take us where it was going to take us. We didn't decide John Jones or Mary Smith was a spy and then try to fucking prove it. All right? So we narrowed it down to this number of people, and there were two or three people who really were good candidates. One strategy mole hunters used was to look at the information lost and see who had access. And in this case, Hansen wasn't even on the list of suspects. Mole hunters had put the spotlight on the CIA. There was another man in U.S. intelligence, a spy with top-secret clearances, a trusted insider, just like Hansen. But he worked at the agency not the Bureau. We started looking at Ames particularly closely. Ames was Aldrich Ames, a 30-year veteran of the CIA. Ames spoke Russian. His work focused on Soviet intelligence services. He had served at posts around the world, Mexico City, Rome, Turkey, and at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. His distinguishing traits? A big personality and a thirst for booze. Redmond's team tried to learn everything it could about Ames, but did this very quietly. The team had an IT guy run Ames' name. He turns up one day with a stack of stuff after he'd done Ames' last name, in this huge stack of Ames, Iowa. (laughs) And I go, what the fuck is this all about? The investigators used another tried-and-true tactic. Follow the money. Redmond remembers when a CIA colleague told him there was a pattern. She leaned up against the door, my door jam, and said, we got the son of a bitch. She had found two things, two serious things. Dates of meetings that he had reported when working against the guy in the embassy downtown, and then dates of bank deposits. Meeting with Soviets was part of Ames's day job at the CIA. But there was something else. A day or two after such encounters, Ames would drop a lot of cash in the bank, thousands of dollars a stroke. Ames also appeared to be spending beyond his means on, among other things, home remodeling, finely tailored suits, and even a Jaguar, the car, not the exotic cat. We got some data that really connected him to some KGB activity, all right? What Redmond won't say here is that the CIA had a good source in Moscow inside the KGB. The source reported some of the places and dates the mole had been overseas, but didn't know his name. The information matched Ames.
During this time, Hansen was dark as a spy, laying low. Meanwhile, the FBI launched a full investigation into Ames that culminated in a guilty plea and a life sentence in 1994. Ames' wife was also arrested for aiding and abetting his espionage. In a stunning sign that the Cold War may not yet be over, Justice Department officials today charged Aldrich Ames and his wife Rosario with spying on America for the Russians. The Ames couple caused significant damage to our national security and betrayed their country. Ames' security compromises virtually destroyed CIA operations in the Soviet Union. Ames had done grave damage to the intelligence community. Some of the information he disclosed was exactly the same as the information Hansen was sending, like the Soviets spying for the U.S., the ones who were later executed. The redundancy validated the information for the Soviets. Ames also compromised one more thing, the working relationship between the FBI and CIA. It was a disaster. The FBI wondered, how could the CIA miss such an awful spy like Ames, someone operating right under their noses? This question would, as you might have already figured out, come back to haunt the FBI. The Bureau was in charge, and they didn't want to let us forget it. One more problem. The losses attributed to Ames still did not equal all that was known to have been compromised. The U.S. had lost human assets and spy programs that Ames knew nothing about. He simply did not have access to them. So the FBI kept up the hunt and the pressure on the CIA. The Bureau zeroed in on another suspect it believed to be the mole. They squeezed him almost to the point of breaking. All the while, Hansen continued to operate in the shadows. From CBS News, I'm Major Garrett, and this is Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen, Episode 5, Wrong Man. The FBI and CIA knew that Aldra James alone could not account for all the information that was lost. So, with the FBI leading, they started looking into other compromised cases. One in particular caught their interest. It happened back in May of 1989 and centered around an American diplomat named Felix Bloch. Bloch was a senior State Department official. He had been the acting ambassador in Vienna. CIA officer Brian Kelly worked the case. He died in 2011, but we have this interview from 2010. Kelly's specialty was identifying illegals, deep cover Russian spies living under assumed identities. And this case with the American diplomat happened to involve an illegal that Brian Kelly had discovered. The illegal was seen dining with the American diplomat, Felix Bloch, in Paris. There were some bags passed in, in uh, some foreign capitals. Uh, Black said that those bags were filled with postage stamps. Other people said that it might have been something else. U.S. intelligence didn't know what was in the bag, but they were increasingly convinced it wasn't just postage stamps and that Felix Block was delivering government secrets to the Russians, spying. But they needed proof. To catch Felix Block in the act, they started tailing him and tapped his phone. But a mole was following right along with the investigation. Early one morning... Felix Block's home phone in Washington rang. Again, Brian Kelly from the CIA. In uh, June of 1989, he got a phone call and uh, was told that a contagious disease is going around. We're very concerned about you. You need to take care of yourself. The voice on the phone said he had called on behalf of the illegal, who cannot see you in the near future because he is sick. The call was a warning to Felix Block. Get out or go dark. U.S. intelligence listened as their highly classified investigation of Block was blown. Somebody, somehow, had found out and tipped off the Russians. The question is, how did the Russians know that Felix Block was under scrutiny by the United States government for possible mm -hmm. uh, criminal activities? How, indeed. Unbeknownst to Brian Kelly or U.S. intelligence, the tip had come from none other than Robert Hansen. When the Block case blew up, State Department, Justice Department, 
Federal Bureau of Investigation, Central Intelligence Agency, just a handful of senior officials in there all just know that just this whole case, we never learned to prove it or disprove it. Right. It just blew up on us. Block lawyered up and denied everything. The Justice Department never brought charges against him. So what, what you have is uh, something that gnaws at you. Even so, Brian Kelly's exemplary work on the case was recognized by the CIA. He received a medal for his efforts. When the mole hunters were examining Aldrich Ames and what he did and didn't know, the Felix Block investigation stood out to them. That was one operation he couldn't have blown because he simply didn't have access to it. And that's how the intelligence community figured out it still had a very big mole problem. So the hunt intensified. The FBI and CIA set out again, this time with a list of about 225 candidates, those with access to information like the Felix Block debacle. The investigation had a code name, Gray Suit. This was the search for the big fish. There's no way they could credibly investigate that many people, so mole hunters started to call the field with what the intelligence community calls a matrix. Basically, suspect names in the vertical column, what had been lost in the row across the top. If a person had access to a blown case, they moved up the list. By the time the list had narrowed a bit, that vertical column of names had one crucial unifying characteristic. All worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. This reflected a sense within the FBI that, like the Ames case, the evidence pointed to a culprit at the agency, not the Bureau. Of course, Hansen wasn't on the list. After winnowing the list further, the FBI settled on one prime suspect. For, for all kinds of reasons, the spotlight fell on me. Brian Kelly, the very CIA officer who had been given a medal for his work on the Felix Block case. In fact, his work on the case was so good that it was suspect. I remember walking into a very small, windowless room, just like in the movies. This is Brian Kelly's daughter, Erin. She worked for the CIA, like her dad. In August 1999, she was called in for what she thought was a routine meeting. And there were two individuals who stood up with badges, and they said, um, we're FBI, and we're here to tell you some bad news. Your father is working for the Russians, and we need your cooperation. And I honestly thought I was in some type of a bad dream. I kept pinching myself saying, this can't be true. This cannot be true. You have the wrong person. My father is a very respected, well-known government official. This, this has to be wrong. Brian Kelly excelled at some of the hardest counterintelligence work inside the agency. He served as an officer in the Air Force before joining the CIA. Friends and family told us he was witty, outgoing, charming, blue eyes, Catholic. He was frugal, you know, quick with a coupon, and meticulous about certain things. He would mark down where he could find cheap gas, and he would make maps of his jogging routes. Before Brian Kelly's family was hauled in for questioning in 1999, the FBI and CIA shadowed Kelly for two years, first keeping tabs on him in late 1996 when he was posted at the CIA station in Panama. Specialized CIA personnel trailed him at the airport, when he played tennis, and on his visits to internet cafes where he'd catch up on email. They'd use special technical equipment to sweep up his activity online. One person who did that surveillance work called his browser history so benign. Kelly, who was divorced, appeared to be dating. Shocking. Early in the investigation, before Kelly knew he was the target, the Bureau ran what's called a false flag operation, meant to catch Kelly or walk him into a trap that would expose his guilt. The Bureau sent an undercover operative to his house in Northern Virginia. Kelly explained the approach to Leslie Stahl in a 2003 segment on 60 Minutes. I got a knock on my door, open it up, and there was a gentleman outside, and he said, I come from your friends, and uh, we're concerned. 
Meet us tomorrow night at the Vienna Metro. A person will approach you. We have a passport for you, and we'll get you out of the country. And then, then he left. Did this guy have a Russian accent? Yeah, he had a, he had a heavy Russian accent. So what do you think? I had no idea. I have no... You're standing there saying, what just what? happened? <laughs> you never for a minute said, I'm being suspected of something, and they're trying to trap me. No, no. It no, never actually. crossed your mind? Not at the time, no. Kelly, unaware the stranger was a U.S. government stooge, reported the approach to a senior FBI official the next day, which we should note is exactly what he was trained to do. We should also note Kelly was polygraphed repeatedly and passed repeatedly. And yet, many in the FBI became confident Kelly was the mole. Eventually, that confidence morphed into certainty. To them, things that appeared to clear Kelly were not evidence of his innocence, but evidence of his craftiness. Some thought him to be the perfect spy, the Iceman. And we should say, there was nothing wrong with Kelly being included in the investigator's matrix early in the mole hunt. He was around cases that mattered, and he knew things that had been compromised, like the Felix Block case. But there were other operations that Kelly almost certainly wouldn't have known about, like the tunnel under the Soviet diplomatic compound in Washington, and the 1980s Easy Pass that tracked Russian spies. Those were FBI operations both of which Hansen knew about and handed over to the Russians. And I said, look, guys, nobody in, in CIA knew about that stuff. Paul Redman again, the spy catcher from the CIA. I said, Brian may be a spy, but there's got to be somebody in the bureau because you lost all this stuff. And, and Brian couldn't have been linked to that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I didn't see how he could have been. After Kelly had been transferred back to agency headquarters in the late 90s, the FBI decided to interrogate him. The confrontational interview that August afternoon lasted almost four hours. Agents told Kelly they were convinced he was the mole. The senior bureau agent jumped up, opened his briefcase up, and slammed a piece of paper in front of him, and he said, explain this. And I looked at it, and it took me a moment to realize what it was. It was my jogging map stamped secret. A jogging map, swept up in a search of Kelly's home or car or maybe his trash. A jogging map, not a map of Brian Kelly's dead drop sites, as the FBI suspected. Kelly didn't have any dead drop sites, much less a map of them, because he wasn't the mole. The jogging map was of Nottaway Park, a place where, coincidentally, the real mole, Robert Hansen, made exchanges with the Russians. Kelly and Hansen, believe it or not, lived on the same street in the 1980s, right near the park. They knew each other from the neighborhood. After the interview, Kelly was escorted from agency headquarters, debadged, and commanded to call CIA headquarters for a daily check-in. He was put on paid administrative leave, in government speak, career death penalty in plain English. Perhaps worse? Hours later, the FBI started hauling in Brian Kelly's family for questioning. I want you to picture a normal day. Nothing going on, very special. This is Brian Kelly's son, Barry. The three Kelly kids were in their late 20s and 30s at the time. Each was confronted by the FBI. Barry says agents wanted to speak with him immediately. So I said, now, as in like now, now? You go, now. And I was a little... Uh, thinking that this is crazy. And they said, uh, we've been basically following you for three days and we're outside of the building. I go from a normal day to sitting in a car and as we took off, uh, within you know three or four minutes being told my dad was a spy, a traitor to his country, and that the arrest of him was imminent. The Kelly kids, now in their 50s, sat down with us around daughter Erin's dining room table in Ashburn, Virginia, a suburb near Dulles Airport. And who is the eldest at this table? That would be me. Okay. <laughs> uh, that, oh, definitely it's me. I'm the oldest one at this table, that's for sure. Erin <laughs> lives in a tidy, well-appointed townhouse in a gated community. She had set out sparkling water and cookies for us. It was the Kelly siblings' first joint interview about their dad. This is Brian Kelly's middle child, 
also named Brian. My wife had just given birth to our first child. Because it was just the day before that yeah, the baby was born. The night before, yeah. I got the, um, the call on my phone in my office, hey, the FBI is here to see you. And I thought I was going to get the big surprise because it was my first born And I thought they were throwing a surprise party for me with this FBI garbage. It was a surprise, all right, but no party. It kind of went from the best day of my life to the worst in a matter of less than 24 hours. That memory uh, will never be erased. My father, he raised us patriotic. And here was somebody saying that your dad was the biggest traitor in that country that he raised you to love so much. It was a very difficult day. Son Brian couldn't believe it. But that didn't stop him in the recesses of his mind, that place where childhood memories reside, from wondering. So that always bothered me some, that there was that slight percentage where I thought it could be true based on the fact that the people that were telling me were the ones that my father raised me to believe. I was called to meet with a background investigator for a character reference. At first, that did not sound odd to Aaron, who also worked at the agency. Background checks were routine. But this was not routine. Her mind raced. And I remember the um, gentleman pounding his fist on the table saying, we have evidence. We have proof. Your father's working for the Russians. And immediately I thought, my life is over. I just remember breaking down. And I was actually escorted out of the building and was told I had to take um, off my badge and I could no longer come back to work until the investigation was completed. So my career went to basically a halt through no fault of my own. The FBI also visited Kelly's ex-wife, his sisters, and threatened to question his mother, who was in her 90s. I want to make sure that that you have the same recollection. They did not say to you or to you, and I want to ask this of you, that they suspected this. They said... They were sure of this. 99% sure. Oh, yeah. I said, so what are you going to tell me as I'm going to walk down my driveway, pick up the Washington Post, and see my dad and they're being arrested? Yes. And when is it going to happen? It's imminent. So all they wanted from me was to find out what role I played. Agents used a phrase that rings in the ears of Brian Kelly's family, colleagues, and friends who were confronted by aggressive FBI investigators in 1999 at the exclusion of all others. The FBI said that over and over. Brian Kelly was the mole at the exclusion of all others. After the confrontations in August of 1999, investigators changed their tactics from monitoring to a chokehold. The FBI obtained sealed warrants from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to tap Kelly's phones. There was so much static, and we just could never hear each other. FBI teams searched Kelly's home while he was out. And when he got back... He saw a screw in the middle of the floor. You know, that kind of shows, like... Somebody was here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oops. Oh, then... <laughs> Kelly wasn't confined to his house, but when he was there, it was impossible not to be unnerved by the conspicuous number of supposed maintenance workers outside. When he did leave, his car was tailed. Whenever we would take a a road trip to visit his sisters during the holiday time. We were under surveillance, and I remember it being a very um, unusual bad snowstorm from Virginia to Connecticut. And I remember asking my father to pull over at a hotel so we could could rest because the visibility was so poor. And he said, are you kidding me? He says, we're being followed. I'm going to make them work for their money. It's just the, um, you know, the notion of never feeling like, you know, you can be free. Brian Kelly again on 60 Minutes in 2003. You're totally dominated every day with when is the next shoe going to drop? When are you going to be intercepted and thrown up against the hood of the car and and charged with espionage? You cannot escape it. Brian Kelly couldn't escape until the FBI realized its error. One of the people Brian Kelly knew best and who knew the spy game better than most was Father Mark Moretti, a Catholic priest in Northern Virginia. Moretti himself served a decade in the Diplomatic Security Service before leaving to study for the priesthood. Moretti ministered to many at the agency. He met Kelly there in 1997. Brian 
began to tell me that he was concerned about colleagues of his who were under a lot of stress. Uh, he noticed a lot of alcoholism. He saw divorces. He saw, in some cases, drug abuse. And what Brian envisioned was the two of us pairing up eventually and creating what today would be called a wellness program. Keeping our nation's secrets coiled up inside is stressful work when one misstep can cost lives. Ironically, he was the one that was going to wind up needing a wellness program when this whole uh, false allegation occurred. Moretti was one of Kelly's first calls that day in August 1999 when he was confronted and banished from headquarters. Oh, yeah, it was devastating. After crying his eyes out and getting his, trying to get his composure, he called me. And he said, Father Mark, I'm in big trouble. You that know? night? Yeah, that night. What did you think? I couldn't believe it. I was sitting there listening to him. We were having a cup of coffee. We sat in the kitchen for about an hour and a half, and he told me what happened. And I said, Brian, are you telling me that the Bureau, after all that, didn't read you your rights and, and put the handcuffs on you? He said, no. I said, this doesn't add up. And so we just both went in uh, to the church, and we knelt down, and we prayed our hearts out. What do you pray for at a moment like that? Well, first of all, for strength. All of his joyfulness and all of his energy and everything like that had just been sucked right out of him. So really, it was I asked God for strength. I said, Lord, please. I said, uh, you know, your son knows what it's like to be falsely accused. You know, please help us. You know, at a time like this, it's very important, you know. Boy, it was tough, yeah. The scorching FBI scrutiny and accompanying isolation seemed endless. He was under unbelievable pressure yeah, and stress. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in that position, you know. Every single day, I mean, he literally could feel the tension in his chest. He never got any sleep at night. He was just a, a very stressed out individual. Father Moretti told us Kelly struggled with thoughts of suicide. Thank God he had faith. Can you imagine that Brian had not been a man of faith. And the FBI gave him that horrible confrontation interview and said, go home, you know, and stay there until we, and you know, at that point he just despaired and said, my life's over. And drove down to the key bridge, parked the car and jumped off and, and with the FBI right behind him following him. You know, they'd have fished his body out of the water. They said, oh, Miller time, we caught him. You know, that's it. And Hanson would still would have been in place. So thank God he had faith. I hadn't thought about that. I look back on that, and I'm like so grateful to God that he, he did not become despondent and say, my life's over, which a lot of people probably would have felt in a moment like that. So. And that would have been all the confirmation the FBI needed. That's right, yeah. Because it would have validated their, their uh, work up to that point. After more than four years of scrutiny, once the FBI caught the real mole, Brian Kelly was reinstated at Langley. But Kelly could never shake the stench of having been suspected. It's just the way it is, even when you're cleared. The agency did let him teach courses on what he'd learned over his career. The people we talked to at the FBI and CIA, several of whom were involved in the Kelly case, said the Bureau's pursuit bordered on obsession that it was initially where the evidence led, but then it went too far, was too invasive, and relied too heavily on circumstantial evidence. Almost all said it was a mistake for the FBI to look at Kelly and not others, too. Here's Paul Redman again, a former top CIA spy catcher. A bureau investigation is not a seeking for the truth. It's to make a case. Once they decide... This is my words. All our energies are to make that case. They're not looking for the right answer, necessarily. So when they get the wrong person, it's really hard for them to get off that wicket. Others, though, defended the Bureau's approach, even if Kelly was collateral damage. In that 60-minute segment we played earlier, one of the FBI's top counterintelligence officials, David Zadie, argued his investigators followed the best information they had, which led to Kelly. We haven't pinpointed Brian Kelly for any other reason except he fits into the facts as we know them. The facts as they knew them included Kelly's work on the Felix Block case. He helped crack the case, and Robert Hansen had blown it to the Russians. I think that Brian Kelly 
may have been wronged in this, but eventually we were able to get them all. I get the impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you didn't learn anything. You wouldn't do anything different. That's the impression you've left. You'd do it the same way. Well, how would you not? Kelly got a lawyer, but never sued the government. All he wanted was to go back to work. It took a while for the Bureau to say sorry, and that frustrated the Kelly family. After months of his lawyer prodding the FBI, Kelly finally got a letter. I sent him an apology. Tom Picard was the FBI's deputy director, the number two man at the Bureau. What were you apologizing for? For the length of the investigation and for uh, the time it took to uh, clear him. Is it hard for the FBI to apologize? It's hard for anybody to apologize. Uh, the FBI is uh, over a 100-year institution, and it's very difficult to uh, apologize, but sometimes you have to. We wanted to understand how something like this could happen. Picard rejects the notion that his agents were too aggressive and told us investigators sometimes target the wrong person. It's just an unfortunate part of law enforcement. I, I don't think they were overly harsh. Uh, it, it, we were trying to determine if the, somebody was you know, committing treason, and uh, we had to be very aggressive at it. And it's unpleasant. It definitely is. Nobody likes to be scrutinized. Treason is something that we can't tolerate. There was never unanimity among the roughly 25 investigators pursuing Kelly. About a third of the team believed the evidence didn't add up, that Kelly was the wrong guy. Did the agency have the ability, in Brian's case, to push back at any point? I think the short answer is no, really. Barry Royden was the top counterintelligence official at the CIA between 1999 and 2001, the window when Brian Kelly faced the most intense scrutiny. The team pursuing Kelly was composed of investigators from the FBI and CIA. But a government report later found that the CIA was, quote, not an equal partner in the mole hunt. The FBI led, the CIA supported. Royden knew Brian Kelly fairly well. After it was all over, Royden was invited to a dinner celebrating Brian's exoneration. And I did speak up and said that uh, I was obviously terribly pleased that Brian had been found innocent. And I regretted that um, I hadn't been smarter to see the weaknesses in the case and to perhaps have spoken up. Brian Kelly died of heart failure at age 68. The year was 2011, a decade after Hansen's arrest, a decade after the FBI's misguided scrutiny of Kelly mercifully ended. Did this take a toll that ended his life prematurely? Again, the Kelly children. No one's ever going to know, but I believe that the stress properly sped up uh, his premature expiration. Do you think it, Absolutely. Uh, it brought his life to a yes. premature end? I do. I do. No doubt. Does it uh, strike you three that... In this parallel world, you had a vociferous public anti-communist, a vociferous public devout Catholic, a vociferous public patriot who was none of those things hmm. in Robert Hansen. Hmm. And you had a quiet man of faith, a quiet man of patriotism, and a quiet man of rivalry against the Soviet state. The quiet man is falsely accused. The vociferous public man almost gets away with it. Yeah, great movie. Great movie. <laughs> that sounds like a great opening. <laughs> that laughter carries with it sorrow, softened by time. The humor, darkened by it. We mentioned in an earlier episode, Hanson and FBI Director Louis Free, both Opus Dei Catholics, attended the same church. Kelly wasn't a regular there, but showed up occasionally. Could you imagine being Jesus at this Opus Dei Mass where you have Louis Free praying, hey, please help me to catch this criminal in the same 
pew, you have Bob Hansen saying, Lord, please help me get away with my spying. And then in the other pew, you have my dad praying, please catch the person who's doing it because I'm innocent. And they're all talking to the same person. A public reckoning came in 2013, two years after Brian's death. Please. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Patricia McCarthy Kelly, his widow, confronted a former senior FBI official who played a leading role in the investigation. It happened at an event at the International Spy Museum in D.C. Why is it that he was left out in the cold like that? Mike Rochford, by then a former FBI agent, answered in his personal capacity. The drive that we had really was based on a sincere, honest belief that we could be losing sources on a continuing basis unless we plug the hole. There's nothing that Brian did in any aspect of the investigation that made us feel that, uh, you know, he had passed anything to the Russians. And if I had anything to do over again, it would be not to open up the case on Brian. But I'm sorry for all the pain and that was brought to you and your family. And we, we felt like we were on the right set of trails. We were, if we'd have only been not so egotistical as to just look at the agency, we'd have looked internally, we probably would have seen that, that we were wrong. In 1999, while Brian Kelly was under intense scrutiny, Vladimir Putin, an old hand at the KGB, came into power in the new Russian government first as prime minister, and then as president. Around the same time, Hansen decided to start spying again. Our colleague, Ward Sloan, reading from Hansen's letter to the Russians. One might propose that I am either insanely brave or quite insane. I'd say neither. I'd say insanely loyal. Take your pick. There's insanity in all the answers. I have, however, come as close to the edge as I can without being truly insane. My security concerns have proven reality-based. I'd say pin your hopes on insanely loyal and go for it. Only I can lose. The Bureau and CIA continued efforts to recruit former KGB officers. They dangled cash and other inducements to see if anyone might have information that would help whack a mole in the U.S. intelligence community. Mostly, these pitches went nowhere. Then one day, it worked. He says, uh, what do you want? So, well, let's sit down. I want to make you the most successful Russian-American businessman in the history of our two countries. That's next time on Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen. This series was reported by me, Major Garrett, Arden Fari, and Sarah Cook. Our team of reporters and producers also includes Jamie Benson, Pat Milton, Jake Rosen, and Nellie Watson. Our producing partner is Neon Hum Media. Our senior producer is Odelia Rubin. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Original music and sound design by Hans Dale Shee. Additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Executive producers for Agent of Betrayal are Arden Fari, Shara Morris, and me, Major Garrett. Special thanks to Mark Lima, Megan Marcus, Ingrid Cyprian Matthews, and Steve Racies of CBS News, and Jonathan Hirsch of Neon Hum Media. We welcome you to contact us at agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. That's agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. Our thanks to C-SPAN, Federal News Network, 60 Minutes, the Bernie Reeves Intelligence Collection, North Carolina State University, the North Carolina Museum of History, the International Spy Museum, Christopher Burgess, Kathleen Hunt, and Patricia McCarthy Kelly. Thanks for listening.